The job of an archaeologist is to explain the past to us. But there are times when explaining the past is tantamount to explaining the impossible. There are things that our greatest minds simply can't fathom. Often, the problem of an archaeologist or scientist looking at an ancient place or an object is to try to explain the technology that went into its construction. And there are times when they can't, as you're about to see. Something as simple as providing a reliable supply of clean water involves technology. And in Roman times, it was technology of the kind we see on display here. It's a Roman water system that was recently discovered during planned archaeological excavations at Stabiae, a site close to Pompeii in Italy. Like Pompeii, Stabiae was destroyed and buried by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79. Before that happened, it was known across Roman lands for its beautiful coastline and coastal villas. Those villas would have been the epitome of luxury during the first century, and that's down to little perks like the water distribution system. Among the discoveries is a decorated lead tank called an impluvium. The tank is connected to a pair of pipes forming an atrium that fed water through the wider complex of villas in the area by regulating the flow into various rooms. Water went wherever it was required. But the clever part was that the water didn't go where it wasn't required. The tank even had stop keys, much as the water supply in your home does today. You've probably heard of the most famous modern and ancient Egyptian cities like Cairo, Thebes, Memphis, Luxor, and Alexandria. You probably haven't heard of the ancient city of Tapaziris Magna on the country's northern coast. So allow us to change that. In November 2022, archaeologists found a series of ancient rock-cut tunnels hidden beneath the city. The tunnels run beneath the so-called Great Tomb of Osiris, which doesn't house the remains of Osiris because the deity is fictional, but has been speculated by some Egyptologists to be the place where Cleopatra is or was buried. The tunnels are almost 40 feet below the ground and run on for 4,000 feet. Experts have noted similarities between these tunnels and the Tunnel of Epilinos in Samos, Greece, and so have speculated that the newly discovered tunnels may date to the time of Greco-Roman rule in Egypt around 2300 years ago. The tunnels might be connected to the fact that the foundations of the temple in Tapasiris Magna are submerged in water, as the water might have reached them through the tunnel. But more study is required before that can be confirmed. Kafir Khat is the name given to a set of ancient Hindu temples in the Dera Ismail Khan region of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in Pakistan. They were discovered by modern-day archaeologists in 1915, and despite the many advances in technology in the hundred-plus years since the discovery, it's fair to say that we don't really know much more about them than we did on day one. The site is sometimes also referred to as Northern Kafir Khat, which helps to distinguish it from another, smaller set of ruins more than 20 miles away, which are also called Kafir Khat. There are five temples at the site in total, along with a large-scale ancient fort. At the risk of stating the obvious, the structures are extremely old. The problem for scientists and archaeologists is that we have no way of knowing precisely how old they are, or even who built them. It's reasonable to say that they're the work of an advanced Hindu civilization, perhaps the first ever to live in the area. But we don't even know what to call them, let alone the monoliths they built here. The Kachari ruins are some of the most mysterious stone ruins in all of India. You can find them in Daimapur in the northeast of the country, and they're believed to have been standing there since the 10th century. Most historians believe that the Kachari civilization created them, hence their name. But that's little more than a guess based on who was living in the area during that time. Whoever made them left precious little behind in terms of clues about their identity or even as to the purpose of their creation. It's been speculated that they were used as part of a game akin to an extra-large version of chess, which would explain some of the wear and tear that can be seen on some of the mushroom-shaped domes. Sadly, their abandonment has led to a long period of neglect due to which they're in a poor state and continue to deteriorate year after year. 
Technically speaking, they're a protected national monument, but there's no funding provided for their maintenance or preservation, and due to that, they're in danger of crumbling away completely. It's obvious that the Well of Santa Cristina in Polylatino, Italy was an enormously important site for the people who built it. We just don't know why it was so important. It's too decorative and elaborate to have been a simple well, but we can't work out what its other purposes might have been. We don't even know its real name. We only call it the Well of Santa Cristina because of the 12th century church nearby. But the well was built much longer ago than that. It's around 3,200 years old and was most likely made by the Nuragic civilization, who once called Sardinia their own. Unfortunately, the Nuragic people had no written language, so understanding their ancient monuments is a little difficult. The well is surrounded by buildings that might have been dwellings with a central meeting point, but we can't know that for sure. The bottom of the well is accessed by a beautifully constructed stone staircase, and there's a space at the bottom that might have been a place for rituals to be conducted, but we can't say that for sure either. It's an enigma, but it's a very beautiful enigma. Goetz von Berlichingen was both a knight of Germany and a mercenary soldier of the 16th century. He loved nothing more than a good fight, so he would have been devastated when he was hit by a cannonball during the siege of Landshut in 1504 while fighting for the Duke of Bavaria and lost his lower arm. Accounts differ as to whether the cannonball tore his arm off or whether the then 23-year-old warrior amputated his own limb. Goetz was determined to carry on fighting and the doctors of the time found a way to make it happen. They created a new iron limb for him, one so sophisticated that it was capable of wielding a sword, but with a grip so delicate that it could also hold the reins of his horse. Hinges at the bottom of the palm bring in the fingers like a hook when pressure is applied to them, thus closing the fist. Tiny aesthetic details like wrinkles at the knuckles and individual fingernails serve no purpose, but are included in the design anyway. Sadly, history has forgotten the name of the genius who made the knight's iron hand. No great European city was complete without an astronomical clock during the 14th and 15th centuries, and Strasbourg had no intention of being left out of the fun, so they had one of their own made. That's not the one you'll see there today, though. Although it has many design attributes in common with its predecessors, the current Strasbourg astronomical clock is the third of its type to have stood there since the late 1300s. Very few records of the original exist, although the written testimonies of the time say that it had a giant clockwork rooster as part of its ornamentation, and it scared off birds. This third and perhaps most impressive clock has stood since 1843. As you can see from these images, it has an ornamental rooster of its own, as well as a fully operational planetary calendar. As if that weren't enough, there's also a huge globe in front of the clock which ensures that the position of the stars is always shown correctly all year, every year. That's no small achievement for a clock that's over 150 years old. There are myths and legends about giants in the folk tales of almost every civilization in the world. But are they all just myths and legends? Some people say that there's evidence for the existence of giants if you open your eyes and look for it. So open your eyes and look at these enormous ancient masks from Bolivia. Inca legends say that the city of Tiahuanaco was built by giants who survived a great flood and that those giants stood between 10 and 12 feet tall. If that's the case and these giants roamed across the South American country, it might explain the four enormous stone masks that were discovered long ago at Puma Punku. It seems obvious from looking at these artifacts that they were designed to be worn as masks, hence the evenly spaced eye holes. But they're far too big for the average human face or even the face of the largest person alive in the world today. It stands to reason that whoever wore this mask had a far bigger face. And if they had a far bigger face, they presumably also had a far bigger body. The existence of the Vitala Temple in India isn't a secret. Found in Hampi, it's one of the most revered and ornate ancient temples in the whole country. 
built somewhere between the 14th and 16th centuries. It'd be considered remarkable because of its incredible beauty, even if there wasn't anything mysterious about it. But there is. This temple wasn't designed to look good, it was also designed to sound good. Inside the temple is a pavilion containing 56 pillars, each of which makes a different sound when struck with an object. The tour guides who work at the temple insist that every single pillar is tuned to one of the seven notes that make up the Sa Re Ga Ma Sanskrit musical scale. The ancient system of notation is still used in Hindi music today, but was devised thousands of years ago. The strange qualities of the pillars are probably due to the fact that they're composed of a geopolymer blend of metallic alloys, silicon particles, and granite. Officially speaking, geopolymers weren't invented until the 1950s, so they shouldn't be present in this temple at all. The mystery remains unexplained. The mere existence of the Portland vase is a near miracle. Most 2,000-year-old ceramics have been smashed to bits by the time they're found. This ancient Roman artifact is still in one piece. There's a beautiful scene depicted on the cameo glass of the vase, but we have no idea what the scene tells us. Many of the world's leading experts in ancient Roman art and culture have inspected the vase, and most of them have come away with different opinions. Some say it's the story of a meeting between the sea gods, Thetis and Peleus, who go on to get married. Other scholars reject that assertion and say it's a much more traditional depiction of the meeting and marriage of Anthony and Cleopatra. There are even a few experts who've looked at it and decided it shows us the aftermath of the assassination of Julius Caesar. Clearly, like a lot of good art, it's open to interpretation. There's something else going on with the Portland vase, though. At the bottom of the artifact is a cameo glass disc featuring a depiction of Priam. It seems perfectly in keeping with the rest of the vase, but experts say it was added hundreds of years later. Who by? Why? Who knows? During their time, the Vikings were the most accomplished sailors in the world. People of the time claimed that their proficiency at navigating the sea was due to their use of sunstones. These sunstones were said to be able to locate the position of the sun even after it had gone down or when it was hidden by clouds, which would have made navigation much easier. The properties ascribed to the stones make them sound almost magical which is why historians tend to view the concept with suspicion. As of 2010, we're more inclined to believe they were real. That year, a sunstone was recovered from a shipwreck close to the Channel Islands. The artifact has been extensively studied, and it's been proven that its calcite structure produces a double refraction of sunlight that reveals its position even when it can't be seen with the naked eye. This would explain how the Vikings were able to reach North America without the aid of a magnetic compass, and also how they were able to comprehensively outmaneuver all of their opponents in Europe. All the Viking captain needed was a sunstone and a sun compass to go wherever he pleased, whenever he pleased. There are many trinkets and pieces of technology you can carry around with you today to show that you're tech-savvy and fashionable from the latest smartphone to a smart watch. Apparently, ancient Romans also liked to show off their gadgets, and the gadget to be seen with in ancient Rome was a portable personal sundial, even if it didn't work. We've only ever found a handful of the solid bronze devices while exploring Roman archaeological sites, all of which date back to the 4th and 5th centuries, so it seems like only the very wealthiest individuals ever owned them. Each portable sundial came with an adjustable dial so the user could change the latitude, but using it successfully depended on knowing whether the sun was rising or setting, a task that wouldn't have been easy in the middle of the day. The ancient Romans didn't measure time by the hour, so accuracy wasn't always important anyway. But even taking that into account, the lack of practicality means that these were more likely to be decorative items than serious time-telling devices. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.